Hey there, everybody. It's Mike Delisio, and today I'm going to be reviewing Batman The Dark Knight Returns from designers Daryl Andrews and Morgan Donteville and publisher Cryptozoic. In Batman The Dark Knight Returns, you are playing through four books based off of the iconic Frank Miller comic known as Batman The Dark Knight Returns. Let's head over to the table. I'll show you, generally speaking, how the game plays. Then we'll come back here and I'll let you know what I think. All right, here we see a setup for Batman The Dark Knight Returns. And something I just want to point off uh, here at the beginning is that what you're seeing is essentially uh, what would be the retail edition of the game. The main difference being that this is showing some cardboard standees to uh, take the place of like Commissioner Gordon here, for example, or Batman, or... Two-Face, which are kind of the main players in this particular scenario. If you get the deluxe edition of the game, those are replaced by miniatures. All right, so here you can see the Batman mini. I can go ahead and place him in Wayne Tower instead of this standee. And Commissioner Gordon can go right here. And Two-Face can go up here. But essentially, everything else that you're seeing, uh, at least to my knowledge, is going to be the same as it would be for the retail standard edition versus the deluxe edition of the game. Again, deluxe me meaning primarily that you've got these miniatures. So this is a game that is primarily played as a scenario kind of campaign based game where you would play through four books. And so what I'm showing you here is the setup for the first uh kind of book, which is the search for Two-Face, all right, and it tells you what kind of your goal is here, which is to investigate these clues that are about uh, spread around the board that was uh, set up during uh, part of the setup. So the first thing I want to do is just show you a little bit on how the game uh, plays out. I'm not going to go into tremendous detail, um, but uh, there is a bit of a procedure that happens at the start of a round that I'll be referencing a fair amount in the review. So I kind of want to show you briefly how that works. All right, so here you've got your action deck, all right? And this is a big deck of cards that is made up of cards that come specifically from book one, and you can see that denoted there. Let me get that more in focus on the bottom right. And then there are also these starter cards that are denoted with that S. In any, in every one of the games, you'll have those starter cards, but depending upon which book you're playing, you'll mix those in with the starter cards. So in this case, this is made up of the cards from book one and the starter deck. What you do at the beginning of the round is from this big deck, you deal out 12 cards face down. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. All right, those go down into what's called the, the round deck. And what you're gonna do is four times you're gonna turn cards face up and make a couple of decisions, all right? So if I took the top three cards from this deck, what I'm gonna be doing is this. I'm gonna be looking at these cards and evaluating if I wanna put them in the event deck, one of these cards are going to go in the event deck. The other two are going to go to me. So you basically keep two and put one into the event. And so this allows you to choose which four events are going to happen during that round. All right. So I might look at it and say, all right, I'm going to put this lose one grit for each riot on the map in for the event. Because right now, there are no riots on the map. So all that would happen is I'd lose one grip. So I put that here where it says event deck. These are both fight cards. They're red. And so they would just go right here for the time being. And I would do that another few times. So I'm just going to randomly pick one to go into the event deck. If I keep a blue card, a detective card, that just goes in my hand. I hang on to that. Otherwise, it goes in the fight deck. I do it again. Obviously, I would be, I would be making very carefully considered decisions. Uh, in this case, I will just, again, say that I'm putting one in the event deck. These two are both detective cards. They'd come with me. And then one last time, you flip them over. You keep two, and you put one into the event deck and you put the red fight cards here. Once you've done that, what you do is you take all of the fight cards, flip them face over, and shuffle them up. These are drawn at the beginning of a fight, so you know which fight cards you've put in there, you don't know which order they're gonna come out. You also know the four events that you put in the event deck, and you shuffle that up. So you know you've chosen what the events are gonna be for this round, you just don't know what order they're going to come out. You also now have a starting hand of detective cards that you had kept, all right? You Keep the detective cards in hands, fight cards go here, event cards go here. All right, so on your turn, you're going to be going through a bit of a procedure. 
All right, we've already done the start of the round. What you're gonna do is the first thing is, and each round has basically four Batman turns, uh, you are going to draw and resolve an event card. Again, one of those events that you already did. So in this case, I'd flip it over, and this event is add one mutant to a location with at least one other mutant. So mutants are these red tokens. I'd find somewhere that has a, a, a mutant, and I would place it there. Perhaps I would go right there, okay? so. I've done that. Now, I can move to a location, and if there's an enemy token there, I have to land on it, all right? So, I start here. I can move to any of the locations that are connected, okay? So you see these lines on the board. I can move through different uh, locations. The only time I have to stop is if I go into a different district, which is denoted by a different color. So if I start here in Wayne Tower, which I do, I could go into the downtown, uh, or into this district, but I'd have to stop right away because it's a different color. In this district, I could kind of travel anywhere I want as long as it's connected and stop where I want, all right? So let's say, for example, I just went right next uh, adjacent to me to the Gotham City Courthouse. Another thing to keep in mind is that each book's Batman is gonna have some different things you have to keep in mind. It has some movement rules and some fight rules that are specific to that book. This says, whenever you move through a location with two or more adversaries or a riot, take a damage. So I'd want to keep that in mind when I'm moving around. If I'm fighting with cops, I have to lose a grit, which are one of my three kind of tracks that I have to account for. If, if any of those tracks go down, you fail. That's one of the uh, multiple ways you can lose the game. You can also lose by the doomsday clock reaching 12. It starts on two. And you can also lose if you get through all four rounds and you have not completed the um, specific requirements for that book. In this case, case searching for Two-Face, investigating clues, discovering where he is, and defeating him in a final fight. All right, so you move Batman, and then you could also move your ally if you want to. In this particular book, it is Commissioner Gordon. There are multiple allies in the game, Robin and, and many others that you'll be familiar with. And this has specific movement uh, rules for, the, for Commissioner Gordon and an action that he can do, specifically in this case dealing with riots, none of which are on the board right now. All right, once you have moved uh, both Batman and your ally if you want to, then you're gonna go to the fight or sneak. If you're on an enemy token, you have to either fight them or sneak past them. All right? If you sneak, you're just basically going past them onto an open spot. There might be some different rules depending upon the, book, the particular book you're in. But if you want to fight, what you're going to do is you're going to kind of start a new process. So I'm on top of a mutant right here, and I want to fight them because they are protecting a clue, one of the clues that I need to find Two-Face in this particular scenario. So what I would do in this case is determine what the enemy die pool is. In this case, we've got mutants and cops. You don't ever fight against the press, which are in green, because it's Batman. You're not going to fight the press. You're going to sneak past them. But you may be fighting against uh, uh, the mutants for sure, and maybe even potentially the police who are trying to maybe get in the way of your uh, investigation. So in this case, I'm fighting against mutants. There's one, so I'll take one mutant die there. And if there were any mutants that are adjacent to my location, I would add one for each of those. If the boss was in my location, I would add an extra one for those. So in this case, I'm only fighting against one mutant, only one die. I've got a utility belt filled with my six standard batarangs in this particular scenario, all right? Sometimes you can get other more fancy upgraded batarangs. That you see here, all right? What you're gonna do is you're gonna start with your uh, three dice. Now you can choose any of these three. They're gonna have different faces on them. Blocks will allow you to change a hit on an enemy die to a miss. Pals will do one damage. Rams will do a damage, but you have to take a damage yourself of any of those three tracks. So those are your kind of main choices. So they're not all the same. You would pick which ones you wanted, maybe one with a, with a bam, or a pow, I should say, uh, one with a block and one with a ram, all right? So I would go ahead and roll my dice. I got a ram and a pow. I would go ahead and roll the enemy die. I got this symbol here, which I would refer to this card. And in this case, it's a miss. That could be different depending on, upon which book I'm playing in, all right? And so in this case, they missed. I did a pow, which would uh, take that die out. I would have defeated them, I could get rid of this token, and I'd also reveal a clue in this particular book. In this case, it's one of the clues that I'm looking for. It would have said dead end if it wasn't a good one. I put that up in Wayne Manor. Um, 
And now that fight has been resolved. I can do the action on, the, on that particular spot, which is the next thing, use the action space. If you're not on an enemy token, which you would be if you didn't win the fight, but if you're not, you do that, all right? So in this case, we'll just look really quickly at what these different type of, type of action spots do. This one gets rid of a press token from anywhere on the board. So maybe I'd wanna get rid of this press token. Boom, I did, that, uh, I did that action. You can see that there are spots that will raise all of the three uh, tracks, grit, health, and sanity. So if you lose those throughout the game, this is a way that you can gain those back. This spot here allows you to move back on the doomsday clock because that's something that's gonna happen both through events and it happens at the end of the round as well, all right? And so those are, generally speaking, how these work, either removing the different adversaries from the board, moving the uh, doomsday clock back, or raising up your three tracks that you've been kind of losing throughout the game, okay? That is basically how this works. The last thing you have to do is add some adversaries, and I'm gonna show you really quickly how this works. For this particular book, it says that you're adding seven adversaries per round. Uh, I actually would have done this before I started uh, the game, but you get the general idea. It's gonna randomly show you, these tokens are randomized, and they show the different regions and districts on the board. And so I have to choose seven of them. Again, I would have done this before, but I wanted to kind of show you how it is here. So in this particular round, I have two sets of mutants I'm putting out, the press and the police. And, and the numbers I put here have to add up to seven. So how many of the uh, mutants did I want to have in the Mideast region, this whole, uh, or sorry, the Midtown East, so this region here. It's a pretty small spot, so let's say I only wanted to put two there. This is the Uptown East, maybe I wanted to put two there. This is the Downtown uh, region, so all of it, I'd feel a little more comfortable with a bigger number. Uh, maybe I even went three here, and that would add equal to seven. I don't have to put any mutants, that's a bad zero. I'm just going to erase it because I can, this is a dry erase board. Zero. And so three, four, five, six, seven. So what I would do in this case then is take the two mutants and add them to the Midtown East region. Boom, and maybe boom. All right. That is a full Batman turn. You're going to do that. You would move the tracker down, and you're going to continue on going through the same sequence of resolving an event, moving Batman, moving an ally if you choose to, fight or sneak, use an action space, add adversaries. So that's the basic structure of the game. Again, you're gonna win if you can complete whatever the particular scenario tells you to do. You'll lose if you uh, go through any of those examples I mentioned earlier. There are some things I'm leaving out. There are goals that you can be going for that will give you some extra boons. There are, um, vehicles that you might be able to utilize throughout the game. You have to go to Wayne Manor to, to get one of these available vehicles like the Batcopter, and there is a mini for that as well as a standee. And it gives you a, one, a powerful one-time uh, use benefit that you uh, might be able to utilize throughout the game. So there are a couple of little things I've left out, but the main structure of the game is as you see it here. Each book of the game, and again, there are four, are gonna have some variations on this, some different kind of tweaks to the rules. You also are gonna be drawing uh, paths on the board at the round end spot, um, placing riots. If any spot gets completely filled, you would replace it with a riot token. Other things are gonna ramp up the difficulty of the game. Um, you might be drawing one-way paths that de determine which way you can go. You might be destroying action spaces. There's a lot of things that you can do to modify the board using the dry erase markers. All right, well, that's the overview. Let's head over and I'll let you know what I think. Okay, so that overview was an attempt to just kind of show you the general round flow, how the game plays. Keep in mind that depending upon which book you may be playing in, uh, whether it's a standalone or if it's part of a campaign, that there will definitely be some changes to things you saw, maybe some different allies, different dice you might have access to, different movement rules, things along those lines. I was just trying to show you the general flow of the game. The other thing I do want to make very clear is that I am reviewing what I feel is the core game experience, which is the solo game. This was originally a crowdfunded project, and it was originally launched as a solo-only campaign-style game. Throughout the course of the project, they added a versus mode so that you can play as two players. I have not played that mode. 
Uh, so I'm not going to be referring to that here. Everything you see here is referring to the solo game. All right, first off, let's talk about art and components. I'll discuss a couple of things that didn't work as well for me and then the things that I did like. First off is that I felt like the board and the cardboard tokens were a little bit more cheap feeling thinner than I would have liked. This is a very large board, as you probably saw on the overview, and there's a lot of folds to it. And I feel like if you're not careful, the board could tear. Um, so you, you do want to take some care with that uh, because it is such a large board with so many folds. It wasn't the thickest with the, the best kind of uh, folding air, uh, points. So keep that in mind. It felt a little bit cheaper than I would have liked on many of the tokens. Um, and that being said, speaking of tokens, there's really not a great place to put them in the insert. So this is a game that came with a custom plastic insert. And I, generally speaking, am very reluctant, uh, very hesitant to throw away custom plastic inserts. If it's just a, a cardboard insert that keeps things safe during shipping, that's a different story. But this was clearly designed as a custom plastic insert, and it just didn't work well for me. Uh, again, it was very difficult to find a good place to put the tokens. The cards uh, did not stay really uh, very... Uh, contained underneath the board. If you are a card sleever, they were not going to fit in the wells at all. So I did end up tossing the plastic insert for this. It works just fine without one, I feel. You, you, you know, I got some little bit bowls and things to, to hold the components to aid with the setup and teardown, but uh, I do want to point out that the, the, there was a bit of a miss, and it's a shame on that plastic insert. All right, now for the things that I did like quite a bit. The comic book art that is utilized throughout the game, I think is really nice. If you are a fan of those original Frank Miller comics, you're going to appreciate seeing the art on the cards, um, the art kind of throughout the game on the different components. It, it really helps immerse you into that theme if you are a fan of the source material. Um, I also, this is a sm might seem like a small thing, but I really appreciated it, is that when components are book specific, things that you are going to be playing in book one or two, three or four, they put little notations on the actual tokens themselves so that I knew that these were the clue tokens from book one as opposed to the clue tokens for book two. That was really, really appreciated. It made it much easier to organize it. And also when you're doing the setup and teardown, it helps with that quite a bit. Um, the dry erase component works well, meaning that the board itself is basically a big dry erase board. And that was a really smart way to handle a game like this, where you are making changes to the game board without having to make permanent changes. So you're drawing new paths, you're erasing paths or crossing out paths, you're destroying uh, action spots, you're adding modifiers to adversaries, and it's all done with a dry erase pen. Really smart, works very well, and uh, I think that it is a big usability plus in the game. It makes the game much more approachable from a usability standpoint. Something that I feel is neither necessarily good nor bad, this is really going to be a uh, preference issue on what your preference is, is the minis versus the standees. So I showed you a bit of both in the overview. The standard edition of the game is going to come with the cardboard standees, while the deluxe edition of the game are going to come with those miniatures that I showed. The benefits uh, depend upon what you're looking for. So the cardboard standees incorporate more of the comic book art. So if you're looking for more of that, then you probably would want to go with the standees. Although, like the other cardboard components, they're not the highest quality in the world. If you like minis, then those are a nice kind of little tweak to the immersion in the theme. I especially like that they uh, the, the characters have wedge-shaped bases, so they kind of fit nicely into those action spots. So that's nice. Again, neither good nor bad in my opinion. That's something that you're going to have to determine on your own. The next thing I want to do is talk about some kind of benchmarks, high-level ideas that I look for when I'm assessing uh, games. The first is the setup and teardown. That can oftentimes have a lot to do with whether I get a game off the shelf or not. In the case of Batman The Dark Knight Returns, um, it is a long setup. There's no two ways about it. It is uh, lengthy and involved. I mean, you have to really make sure that you are doing everything in a step-by-step -step basis. You're having to kind of randomize those location tokens. You are having to make sure that the characters are where they need to be uh, on the board. You need to set up your cards, make sure that you're getting your starting cards with your book cards. There's a fair amount of setup. However, the game itself is a relatively lengthy game. And so 
it would be a bigger problem for me if you were doing all of this setup for a 30 minute game. This is uh, usually somewhere in the range of 90 minutes I have found. And so I don't find that the setup is too uh, troublesome when you have a game that gives you that amount of length to it. The rules are the other thing I like to talk about, and this is a bit of a mixed bag, some good and some bad. Um, the, 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 all the rules are there, so I'm just going to start with that. I learned the game from the rule book, and I didn't really feel like I was missing too much. What I feel like the rule book does best is give illustrated examples, okay? And so, like for example, when they are talking about combat, they give you an example of a combat dice rolling round. I like that a lot. When they're talking about movement, they give you illustrated examples that, that help illustrate that, and I like it a lot. The only downside really I had with the rule books is uh, that they are not always organized in a way that is most intuitive to me. Maybe that's a, an individual preference thing. There were some times where I felt like things were kind of presented in an order that didn't make as much sense to me. But again, everything generally was there. I learned from the rule book, felt pretty comfortable that I had things, for the most part, all good after my first read through of it. And um, so that part was done well. There are multiple rule books, and for some people that might work, and some people it might not. You've got the core game rule book, which covers the core rules, and the book one setup. And then for the other books, uh, two, three, and four, you've got individual rule books for that that are really not as much rule books as they are um, exceptions to the rules. Different setup uh, instructions, different little kind of tweaks to the formula, so to speak. And then there's a final rule book that covers the versus rules, which I'm not talking about here, and the standalone scenarios, okay? It's going to be up to you whether you are okay with multiple rule books or not. It's becoming more and more of a, of a thing you see in board games, so um, not a huge issue for me, but I figured I'd mention it. Overall game impressions, a couple things that did not work for me, and then the things that I did appreciate. I mentioned earlier that it's not a short game. Um, it, it can feel a little bit longer maybe than you would expect, um, and it's definitely procedural. That is something that may work for some people, it may not where you have to make sure that you are kind of doing things in the correct order, and sometimes it can feel a little bit flowcharty. Okay, make sure I do this, then I activate, I move Batman, then I, then I move and activate an ally, and you know you have to do everything in the correct order because it can kind of mess things up if you don't. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind, is that uh, if you're looking for a breezy 45 minute solo game, this really is not it. Um, I'm not sure yet about the replay value. Uh, I don't know if I could call this a negative because I don't feel comfortable making a definitive statement on this. I have played the game multiple times. I've played through the, the scenario and the campaign, uh, of standalone scenarios and the campaign. Um, but if you're the type of person that feels like once you've played through a campaign, you're done with it, keep that in mind because this is uh, based on the four books of the comic book series. And so basically, if you're playing a campaign, you are playing through these four books. Does that mean the game is not replayable? Not to me it doesn't. I mean, I have no problem going back and playing because there are going to be variables. Things are going to change. Um, one of the things I like the most about the game is going to help with the replay, and I'll just talk about that right now, which is that I absolutely love the way that the rounds are set up. You know, there's four rounds in a game, and you go through this round setup before each of those rounds. And what it does is it gives the player some decision points that I feel like players don't typically get in solo or cooperative games because this is essentially a single player co-op, all right? The specific things I'm talking about are the things I spent some time on in the overview, which is that you get 12 cards from that big action deck and you are choosing two to keep and one to put in the event deck. I think that that's brilliant. I love that because it gives you some sense of agency as a player. You know, it's very common in cooperative games to have events where you flip over an event card and deal with what it says. That can sometimes feel extremely arbitrary and extremely random. In this game, you're choosing what the events are. You know what they are. You don't know what order they're going to come out. That's the one thing you can't necessarily account for, but you are picking what events go in that event deck. I think that is such a great way of giving the player some agency where they don't typically get that agency in games that utilize an event deck. Really smart. I also like how you have the choice of, am I going to take this detective card uh, or am I going to use it as a fight or put it in the fight card? That way, that, the way that works is really smart too, where the detective cards you have access to right away, the fight cards 
you're maybe going to get access to because you draw one, they get shuffled and randomized. You draw one at the start of a fight. I think that's really smart. Um, also, I do think that this works well as both a campaign game and a standalone game experience. Uh, I appreciate thematically why they're making the campaign kind of the, the core experience, where it's a game of attrition and you're really just trying to last through these four books, increasingly getting beaten down until you're on your kind of your last breath and trying to, to, to fulfill what you need to as Batman. And I, it, it does a really good job of that, I think. But I really also just like playing them as standalone uh, experiences. I think they've done a nice job of kind of tweaking the setup in such a way that you can play these as, as one-offs. So, you know, starting much higher on the, uh, on the Doomsday track and, and having kind of scripted setups for where certain uh, tokens are and things along those lines. I think that's really smart. Having some pre-drawn paths and then giving you the choice to draw some paths. It's well done. So I think it works well both ways as a campaign and as a standalone game. I also think that the theme shines through quite well in this game. If you are a fan of Batman, which I am, if you are a fan of this specific uh, era of Batman, this, this iteration of Batman, the, the, the Frank Miller version of Batman, you'll especially enjoy it, and, and I am a fan of that. But I don't feel like you need to be a fan of the Frank Miller comics to like the game. I don't even think you need to be a fan of Batman or comic books to like the game. If you like solo or co-op games that are, are tailored to solo, then mechanically there's a lot of really cool things going on here that I think you might like just as a core game experience. If you like the theme, it's obviously going to bump it up quite a bit as well. The last thing that I'm going to mention is that the difficulty, for some, might feel like it is tuned a bit low. I think that's true, and I don't think I have a problem with that. Um, keep in mind that I've been playing on the normal kind of difficulty throughout. There are many ways, and there are very easy ways, to increase the difficulty of the game. If you feel like you're having uh, no tr trouble at all and you're breezing through, then you can easily ramp up the difficulty. It's not a complicated process. But for me, I liked feeling like I had a shot, right? I liked feeling like, yeah, it was gonna be tough. I knew I was gonna have some, some troubles to deal with, but it wasn't just this. I, I didn't feel like I was completely without agency, without hope, without any type of a chance of completing these scenarios. So uh, I feel like it is tuned just right, but again, it's easy to adjust that difficulty. Overall, I feel like Batman The Dark Knight Returns is a really, really interesting take on the solo co-op game that you can play either standalone or as a campaign. I'm giving it an 8.5 out of 10. Uh, it's one that I just keep wanting to come back to, and, and uh, I wasn't sure going in that if, if this was going to be something I'd want to come back to or if I felt like that once I've gone through it, I'm done with it. I don't feel that way. I want to come back and play it some more. All right, well, that's it for me. This is Mike Delisio signing off from Dice Tower Headquarters.